she's the assistant of the uh, ambassador of Indonesia in Lisbon. She met her. You should bring him back here again. Oh. <laughs> The interview is the, the beauty and the monster. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty and the brain. The beast. Right? <laughs> Otherwise, okay. I'll be sitting in your chair from the brain. Uh, no flash, yeah? Were you now in that session? No, you were not in the no. session. No. So I have to do opening first and then we chit chat a little bit and then I start the interview. Rolling camera? Go. Five. Perubahan politik global tentu saja ini mempengaruhi tidak hanya Asia termasuk Indonesia tapi juga pemain-pemain utamanya seperti Amerika Serikat dan juga Uni Eropa. Nah saya sudah bersama dengan Presiden European Commission ke-11 dan juga mantan Perdana Menteri dari Portugal, Jose Manuel Barroso, Presiden Barroso, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Jakarta. Is this your first time no, in this no, country? No, I've been several times in Jakarta and in Indonesia, yes. How do you like it so far? Very much. I really enjoy it. I think there's a good, good spirit in this country. Good spirit, but not so good spirit right now worldwide, as you know. And um, let's talk about the U.S. for now. So uh, the U.S. is concerted now having this inward and protectionist policy under the new president, Donald Trump. And how do you see this impacting its traditional allies, such as the EU? It's too soon to say what's going to happen with the, the new American president. I hope uh, there will not be this movement for protectionism, because I think it's bad. Bad for, for the United States, but bad for, for the world. Uh, we certainly do not need a trade war today in the world. We need more growth. And so, since this new president uh, is, says that he's so much committed to growth, I think it's very difficult to have growth uh, reducing the um, strong interaction in economic terms uh, with the rest of the world. Because in fact, today the supply chains are so integrated that if you close your borders, you are condemned to um, go backwards and not forward. Mm. There was a huge trade deal was been made by Obama's administration, the TPP, yeah. and now the, U the U.S. has pulled out from that deal. So how do you see this? Well, apparently uh, the idea of the new president is to do it more bilaterally, because apparently he thinks uh, that gives more leverage to the American position. Um, look, I believe that ideally the world should go for a multilateral approach to trade. In fact, uh, that was our first effort at European level. And as you remember, it was not possible to conclude the so-called Doe Around. It was a multilateral trade deal. Uh, even with President Obama, it was not possible. And uh, other countries were also very reluctant. That's why afterwards we started regions to regions. For instance, we also are negotiating with the United States of America a transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Let's see if the new president of the United States wants to put an end on that. Uh, in Europe also there are people who don't like it. I think it makes sense to have more free trade between uh, Europe and the United States for instance. I think uh, it will be good to create more jobs and more growth. Uh, so I'm strongly against all uh, trends for protection because I think they are self-defeating. Mm. Uh, and I hope that we are not going to see much more of that. But frankly, there are in Europe today many concerns about that. You said you mentioned about he's in favor more of bilateral ties as opposed to multilateral uh, engagements. 
but as one of the strongest, if not the strongest economy in the world, will this have a bad impact for the U.S. itself? I think, yes, look, and then an example. Today, our supply chains are very integrated. When we produce a car in Europe, for instance, that car comes from, uh, on average, 12 countries. Mm. If we have restrictions, if you put back tariffs, in that case, of course, the car is going to be more expensive, which is bad for consumers, but it's also bad for the producers because it's more difficult to, to sell. The, the, the car. So um, I think it's sometimes very simplistic to think that we can we can um, put an end to trade by tariffs or by quotas. And what we have seen is that the countries that have made more progress globally in the history of economy are those who are more open. Look, look at China. How was China some years before? China became the so important as it is today, when China was opening more and, in fact, gaining more access outside. In the United States, the same. In the United States, it is when they were, in fact, leading the world in economic terms that they became more rich. If they go for an insular, a closed, parochial uh, position, of course, they will lose uh, economic and not only economic influence in the rest of the world. You mentioned about China. Recently, uh, at the uh, World Comic Forum in Davos, Chinese leader Xi Jinping, in his speech, I quoted him here, pursuing protectionism is like locking oneself in a dark room. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, in his inauguration speech, he mentioned a lot about America's first, and then also his uh, principle now is buy American and hire American. Do you see there's, there's a switch between the U.S. and China in terms of their globalist role? Uh, it is too soon to say. Uh, we have always to make some kind of distinction between the rhetoric and the facts. Let's see the facts. Uh, let's wait for some more time. Uh, but certainly it's uh, curious that it is the, the Chinese president that comes to Davos to make the uh, arguments in favor of globalization. Uh, that would not be possible some years ago. Uh, so, I think we are in a transition phase. It's too soon to judge what's going to happen. But my position, and by the way, the European position has been, and I think it's going to continue to be, in favor of openness. I'm in favor of open societies, open economies, in terms of a multilateral approach, seeing the world not in terms of confrontation, in terms of zero-sum game, because some people think that if I gain in trade, you have to lose. It's a mistake. We can both win or we can both lose. The world today is very integrated in financial terms, in trade terms, um, and even in cultural terms, like because of media, because of information technology. Today in the world, we cannot say your side of the boat is sinking. I think we have an interest in making it a win-win situation. And I think, for instance, for Europe, this openness has been positive because Europe um, is a relatively rich part of the world and the countries, by the way, the countries that were more successful were precisely those that were uh, able to manage better uh, openness relationship with the rest of the world, to be more competitive, to embrace globalization instead of resisting globalization. But we see in Europe now with Brexit, mm -hmm. And then now the rise, of, uh, the rise of populism that may happen also in France or in Germany or in the Netherlands. We, we, they will have an election this year. Where do you see Europe is heading? Is populism really rising? It is Europe rising, maybe? but I think we can deal with it. It's rising, certainly. We have not uh, uh, yet uh, a real populistic uh, uh, far-right leader in Europe. It did not happen. Uh, we were very close in one election but it did not happen. Uh, but there is that, that risk, yes. Because of globalization, people are fearful. There is some kind of anxiety about the future. Um, there is more pressure for nationalism, for more, let's say, protectionism. Uh, we are seeing that, as we see, not only in Europe, in some parts of the world. Having said that, I'm confident that those leaders are not going to be elected. I think that in the Netherlands, in uh, France, and in Germany, the countries where we are going to have elections this year, at the end, 
the leaders are going to be uh, pro-European uh, and uh, pro, uh, let's say, openness and not pro-nationalistic or protectionist uh, uh, orientations. Do you see any uh, change of role of Russia in terms of the, in the global arena with President Trump is in power? Russia is trying to assert itself uh, even before Mr. Trump. We have seen that uh, in the case of uh, Ukraine, where Russia invaded Ukraine, a country that is a sovereign country, a uh, United Nations member, and they in fact made the annexation of part of Ukraine, of Crimea, uh, in clear violation of all the uh, rules of international law. Uh, and also in Syria, there was a void, and one thing we know in international relations, when there is a vacuum, someone takes it. And that's what precisely Russia has done. Well, the Americans were not uh, able to take a decision, and then the Russians took the decision, uh, and uh, in fact now are taking the initiative. Uh, Russia is a very important country, in fact one of the biggest uh, countries in the world, uh, and I think we should engage with them constructively. At the same time, I think uh, we should make clear that there are some kind of behavior that is not acceptable. In the 21st century, to take by force parts of the other countries is simply not acceptable. That's why, by the way, the European position was quite firm and quite clear. So, also about national security. In Europe, as we know, 2016 was a bad year for security. And how does the EU think of handling extre extremism, both Muslim and extremist right? It's a very complex issue. We have to respond in various areas. First of all, in terms of education, education is key make more efforts to integrate those communities in our societies because sometimes this is part of the problem. Also uh, being firm in the control of our external borders and also in our dialogue with other countries, for instance countries that uh, give some kind of protection to those extremists to be very firm. Uh, those uh, Muslim fundamentalists, in fact they are killing more Muslims than Europeans or, or, or Christians. Uh, I think we should ask the Muslim countries to be extremely clear in condemning all forms of extremism. By the way, they are the first victims. They are the first victims. Uh, those uh, terrorists and extremists, they want to replace the leadership in Muslim countries. So it's a very long uh, battle that requires a great mobilization of people across different religions, across different societies. And Europe certainly is feeling uh, that pressure, but uh, the terrorism can hit any way, I mean, any part of the world. In fact, we see terrorism hitting here in Asia, but also in the United States, in Africa, unfortunately, uh, and very close to Europe as well. Um, we have to be persistent and determined in the fight against all forms of extremism, namely uh, this kind of terrorism that attacks uh, innocent lives. Uh, this is completely unacceptable from all points of view. With what's going on in America and then also in Europe, in terms of economically, politically, what do you think that a region like Asia, that is growing a population, just a growing region in general, should gain and take or take advantage from it? I mean, what uh, Asia has been doing, in general speaking, has been a great success. Uh, it was possible in some countries of Asia to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That's a great thing. Uh, and I think it's, first of all, good for the people themselves. But, and that's important to say, it's also important for Europe and for the rest of the world. I'm one of those who believes that when you get better, I don't get worse. We can get better at the same time because we are creating also more markets. So uh, I welcome the positive developments in Asia. Now, having said that, there are also risks in Asia. We see that there is a rhetoric and some confrontational, some geopolitical risks. Uh, I hope that our Asian friends and partners will be able to, to, to moderate themselves, to uh, find uh, uh, solutions through uh, dialogue, amicable agreements, because that's not, that's not good. I mean, when we see some kinds of threats and some kinds of uh, uh, statements, uh, it's also a matter uh, of concern. Um, uh, I hope and I think it's going to happen that uh, um, Asia will continue to be uh, in the near future a uh, source of growth for the people of Asia first of all but also for the rest of the world. 
And uh, I hope that uh, the leaders in this region will also be able to fight against some extremism trends that we are seeing in some of our societies here. You're in uh, Jakarta for, uh, as an invitation for the uh, International Peace Foundation. So what do you hope to achieve to share uh, with your audience here? Uh, uh, um, this is a very interesting program. It's uh, very often they invite people that have received the prize, uh, the Nobel Prize for Peace. I received it, not for me personally, but on behalf of the European Union in 2012. It was a recognition of the Nobel Prize for Peace for everything that the European Union has been doing for peace. The European Union is a process for peace. Let's not forget that Europe was completely destroyed in the 20th century by a war that became, in fact, two wars that became world wars that were European. But thanks to the European integration, today, I would say that it's almost everybody thinks impossible a war before, again, uh, like before. Um, those people that were enemies like France and Germany, today it's unthinkable to have a war. Uh, so what I'm coming here to share uh, with my uh, friends from Indonesia is the European experience in terms of regional integration, in terms of multiculturalism, in terms of uh, um, what we can learn from each other uh, based on, on the developments that we have known in the European Union. Being also very honest about the difficulties, because there are difficulties, but if you take a longer perspective, you will recognize that Europe today is much better than 20 or 50 years ago. Part of Europe uh, was under totalitarian rule, rule. And if you look at all the indicators in terms of life expectancy, child mortality, level of, of education, Europe is much, much better now than before. And it's, in fact, one of the most prosperous and wealthiest regions in the world. President Rosso, obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Tadi foto gak, Gi? Sorry, jadi nanti take uh, posingnya aja Oh, uh, pas salaman? Iya, lu suka ngomong aja Oke So, I think I'm going to retake us Oke okay. So, obrigado is for women Iya yeah. Obrigado is for women Satu sop aja Sou obrigada. Obrigada.